What an incredible opportunity we had just a little bit over a week ago to put just some tangible expressions of love into action around us, where we live, where we work, where we play. And I love it when I see our church family love that way. And I just want to say thank you for all those who participated. I think uh, thankful for our mobilization team, who's doing a good job helping us really not just sign up for a bunch of projects, but really develop a lifestyle, what it really looks like to live and to love like Jesus. And last Sunday night, as we worshiped in the park, what I said is true. Welcome to week three of Love Our City. We, we never intended this to be like something for seven days but really something for 365 days, like 24 hours a day, uh, 60 minutes every hour, just that kind of living. And so I want to encourage you to continue to uh, live and love like Jesus and look for opportunities that God has given you where you live, where you work, where you play to serve others and to do that in the love of God. And if you're looking for an opportunity to do this with other people, go ahead and put Saturday, October 22nd on your calendar. It's going to be another Love Our City moment, and we'd love for you to join us. Over the past uh, few months, my siblings and I have been taking care of some responsibilities that were left to us after the passing of our father back in February. Um, among those things were to prepare the house that my parents owned since 1979 to be sold and to clear out all the contents that they had gathered over 58 years of married life and raising four kids. Let me just say they had some stuff, okay? And all that stuff had to go. And the reality of that was um, my siblings and I met in my hometown of Maysville, and we spent some special moments. I would even describe them as sacred moments together as we walked through the halls of that home where we all were, grew up, um, as we recounted memories and moments that we had shared there, and as we went through, went through mounds of pictures. And one of the things that we stumbled upon as we were going through all of that stuff is we found lots of letters that my dad had handwritten to a variety of people for a variety of reasons. Um, we've uh, heard since my dad passed that there's many people have told us about like handwritten birthday cards and thank you notes and encouragement letters that he had written to them. My dad had incredible penmanship. I mean, he wrote everything in cursive, and that's because he never used how to, learned how to use a computer. And the electric typewriter that he did have was like the first one ever invented, right? It was that old. And so when he writes a birthday card to one of my children when they were younger, they could never read it. They're like, uh, Grandpa wrote me a note, but I can't read it. But in those words were always very, very encouraging messages. I've received many letters from my dad. Letters that were meant to encourage me, meant to admonish me, even meant to correct me. And boy, I wish I would have held on to every single one of those now. Do you have a letter like that? Do you have a letter that someone wrote to you that it could have been really 50 years ago, but you still have it and you know where it's at? And maybe you pull it out and read it every so often? We're starting this new teaching series on the book of Romans, and the book of Romans is actually a letter. It was a letter written in the first century to a bunch of people who lived in Rome who were Christ followers. It was written by a guy whose name was the Apostle Paul. It was written for a very specific purpose to a very specific group of people, but I believe that that specific audience extends to include you and me. So I'd encourage you right now to pull out your Bible or open up your device to the book of Romans. We're going to read together as we go through the book of Romans. You can choose to use the Bible in the seat back in front of you. In most of those, page 782 is where you'll find the book of Romans. So the book of Romans opens like most every ancient letter. It opens by the author identifying himself or herself, opposite of what we would do when we'd write a letter. We close the letter by our name. Well, this letter opens with Paul introducing himself as well as the purpose for which he is writing to the Romans. Why don't you follow along with me as I read from Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David, and who, through the spirit of holiness, was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith 
for his namesake. And you also are among the Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. How do you introduce yourself? When you're meeting somebody for the first time, what words do you use to introduce yourself to them? Some of the ways I love to be introduced is, are you Christie's husband? Are you Kay Jenna or, or Kendall's dad? I love being introduced as, are you, are you Bruce and Dorothy's son? I take it as a real honor and privilege to be introduced as one of the pastors at Crossroads Christian Church. How do you introduce yourself? Maybe a little deeper question is, how do people describe you to someone else? Maybe even deeper than that is, how would you like to be known to others? I wonder if you catch how Paul introduced himself, what he wanted to be known for. He uses some phrases to describe himself to this group that he's writing to. And the first thing he says is, I'm Paul, I'm a servant of Christ Jesus. And the root word, the original word that Paul uses is actually the word slave. It's important for us to recognize that there were some status that Paul really enjoyed that meant a lot to him for quite a bit of his life. There was the fact that he was a Roman, that he was born from a Roman father, and he was from the town of Tarsus. But he was also Jewish. He was raised and trained in Jerusalem. He was uh, taught by one of the leading philosophers and, and teachers of that day, whose name was Gamaliel. And because he was a, a student of Gamaliel, we can know that he probably had most of the Hebrew scriptures memorized. He was prolific in multiple languages. Paul was also a Pharisee, which meant he had a zeal for the Old Testament law and a fervor to protect it. So much so that he actually went to persecute and put to death those who described themselves as part of the way, which was a phrase that meant that they had decided to trust and follow Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But now Paul is identifying himself as a slave of Jesus. He says, I have no rights. I have no freedoms. I am completely surrendered and sold out to Jesus. That was how he was identifying himself now. Many of you might know that Paul was once referred to by the name Saul. That was a Hebrew name for him. It was probably taken from the Old Testament famous King Saul, who was described as a mighty warrior, but he also stood head and shoulders above everyone else. Now Paul's writing this letter, and he describes himself by using his Gentile or Greek name, and that is Paul. In Latin, it means the little. It was not a statement of just Paul's stature. Most people think physically he was tall or small, short, but it's actually a description of his posture, of his attitude, of his life, of how he wanted to be known. Paul said, oh, let me point out that this is really not Paul going through an identity crisis. It's really him recognizing who he was created to be. Paul says, I'm called to be an apostle. You can read about Paul's conversion to Christ, as well as his calling from Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 22. While he was traveling on a road to Damascus to persecute other Christ followers, Paul was confronted by Jesus. And in that moment, Jesus revealed to him what his plan for his life should be. In fact, he gave that message ahead of time to a guy named Ananias, and he told Paul to go find Ananias. When Paul, or when God revealed to Ananias the instructions he had that Ananias was to give to Paul, he was a little reluctant. He had knew the reputation of Saul, who had persecuted so many Christians. But this is what Scripture records. The Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings, as well as to the people of Israel. When you see the word apostle and it has a capital A, it's referring to those original 12 disciples who were with Jesus, who spent time with him in person and also were witnesses of his resurrection. Minus one, that's Judas. But it also includes the Apostle Paul because of this firsthand experience he had with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus that day. Paul, in this moment with the Romans, he actually uses a lowercase a. And that just indicates anybody who is set apart, sent and given identity and responsibility. This is something that any one of us can be when we say yes to following Jesus. It's like 
Peter using the word priest to refer to all of us who are followers of Jesus with a lowercase p, not a capital P. Anyone who has a life transforming encounter with Jesus is a person who is set apart and sent. Paul says, I am set apart for the gospel of God. Paul explains in those first few verses of the letter who Jesus is and what the gospel is all about. It says Jesus, who was spoke about by the prophets, being fully God and fully man, was anointed by God to usher in the reign of God. He was completely holy. And if that wasn't enough, he proved his deity by resurrecting from the dead. That's why we gather this morning to worship him. That's why he is worthy of us using him as our point of reference of how we live and how we love. Paul says, by him and through him, we've received grace through faith. Now, Paul's going to take the rest of the letter, all 16 chapters and 21 verses remaining, to tell us exactly what that is all about. The book of Romans was written to them and to us to show us who God is, to help us understand that how to have a relationship with him, to discover how to live out our faith, to experience true community with the people of God, and to learn how to live on mission. All of that, my friends, is what we call the gospel. The gospel is the good news that God is powerful and holy and trustworthy, just and merciful, that he created us to have a relationship with us, but we made a mess of that and fractured that relationship when we chose to disobey him and sin. But he pursued us in love through grace to redeem and reconcile the relationship with us. Having surrendered lordship to him, we now live in a relationship with him and bask in the salvation that he provided for us. While we pursue holiness, as well as join him in the mission of sharing that same good news that we have experienced with the world around us. That, my friend, is what the gospel is all about. In verse 7, Paul writes, to the, writes his letter to the Roman believers. So many of us think that the gospel is for unbelievers, but it's really for everyone. Paul says it's for all those who are loved by God and called to be saints. You see, the gospel is not just about not going to hell or just going to heaven. The gospel is not just about what you were saved from. It's really about what you're saved for. In the next couple of verses, Paul says some really encouraging and endearing things to the Romans. He says this, I thank God for all of you. Because of the grace that Paul had experienced from God, he was always just so grateful. In fact, many of the letters that he wrote, 13 of them are recorded in the New Testament. They all open with very similar greetings. One thing that Paul says to the Romans is unique. He says, your faith is being reported all over the world. No one would have been surprised to have a bunch of people following Jesus, let's say, in Jerusalem, because that was like the, the hub or the capital of everything religious, right? But to have people living in the pagan capital of the world, Rome, who were following Jesus, well, that was something that the world was noticing as well as talking about. Paul stressed how many times he wanted to come and visit Rome to be with them, but something had always prevented it. Paul was a pretty busy guy. I mean, in the, already at this point in his life, he had completed two missionary journeys, taking the good news about Jesus all around the world. And as he's writing the book of Romans, more than likely he's in Corinth on his third missionary journey. He said that his visit would have been mutually edifying and encouraging. But it also was very strategic to visit Rome. Rome, because it was the capital of the Roman Empire, it allowed the distribution of the gospel to go any and every way. It was pivotal to taking the gospel to places like France and to those other locations that were considered the ends of the earth. Paul did not plant the church in Rome. Many believers came to faith in Jesus when they were in Jerusalem and heard Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. They placed their faith in Jesus Christ and they returned back to Rome. And when they got there, they began gathering weekly to study the scriptures, to pray together, to have fellowship with each other, to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and also to serve the needs of those around them. 
Those are the same reasons we gather even this very moment. Paul makes two very emphatic statements in this opening chapter of Romans 1. The first is recorded in verse 14 and 15. He says this, I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. In Rome, there were people who were Jew and Gentile. They were educated and uneducated. There were the powerful. There was the marginalized. There was every status differential and delegation that you could imagine gathered in Rome so that Paul could share the gospel with them. And he makes this next emphatic statement in verse 16 and 17. He says these words, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, but also to the Gentile. For in the gospel, righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. That verse is like the cornerstone of the entire letter. It's the key to understanding the rest of the letter. It's something that Paul is like dogmatic about in a good way because he doesn't want anybody to miss it. Whole sermons, books, a plethora of material exists about this one emphatic statement by Paul. Some have wondered, why do you think Paul had to say that he was not ashamed of the gospel? Was it because that at one point in his life he was ashamed of the gospel? Was there a time in Paul's life where he was maybe ashamed because of the past choices he had made and the mess he had made of the life God blessed him with? Maybe he was just done with being criticized and doubted and even just um, persecuted by those who didn't believe his conversion was true. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because I've experienced the gospel. Some believe that Romans is probably the, the the strongest theological treatise on the gospel in the whole Bible. But it's also Paul's autobiography. The gospel is good news. It's the good news of the power that transformed Paul from what he was to what he is. And it's for everybody, both Jew and Gentile. And I'm pretty confident that 100% of us fit into either one of those categories. The gospel is about the salvation that brings righteousness. Not earning or attaining based on performance or perfection, but based on faith in Jesus, who was holy and therefore is capable of becoming the punishment for sin in our place, as well as extending to us his righteousness in return. And that is the mantra of every letter that Paul has penned. And we're going to see that all throughout this letter to the Romans. And it's a good thing, because we all need the gospel. We all need the grace that God has offered us, every one of us. And that's the next theme that we see in Paul's opening part of his letter to the Romans. Follow along as I read now from verse 18. This is really good news. Paul says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God's made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. When I read those words, I kind of wonder, like, who ticked God off, right? I mean, you could tell that he's upset. First, let me make it clear that God's wrath is not a contradiction to his righteousness or his holiness. It's actually part of it. It's because God is holy and righteous that his wrath is poured out on all wickedness and godlessness. He has no sin and has nothing to do with sin. Notice that Paul says that God's wrath is being poured out on the godlessness and the wickedness, not on the godly or the wicked. He makes it clear that humankind has made a choice to suppress the truth about God that is plain about God. Plain from what he has made in creation. 
plain from what scripture reveals about him, plain from the incarnation of Jesus in the flesh. But instead of glorifying God for who he is and being grateful for what he's done, they dismissed the truth about God. They claimed to be wiser. They saw joy and fulfillment and purpose, satisfaction in created things instead of in the creator. Paul says in Romans 1.25, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. I actually found a picture of the people that Paul is talking about in those verses. I brought it with me so maybe you could see it. This is the picture of the person that Paul is referring to when he writes those words. We all need to grasp and understand fully that when Paul is talking about they, he's actually talking about us. We are the people. You and I are the people that Paul is describing in that way. And with that in mind, you might say, well, how have I done that, right? Well, maybe all of us have pursued power or popularity or pleasure in the things that the world offers us, maybe in the way that people identify us or or view us, rather than pursuing holiness and worth and value in God alone. I'm sure all of us have thought we know better when it comes to making decisions or choices about our lifestyle instead of trusting God's instruction and his design. I think all of us have probably treated people lesser than. We've taken advantage of them. We've abused or neglected others simply due to our own selfishness or pride or even hatred instead of loving people the way that God has loved us. I'm sure all of us have allowed our affection, our devotion, our energy, our effort, even our allegiance To be directed toward things like our work or our relationships, our possessions, our status, even our own sports teams, instead of toward our creator, instead of our savior and Lord. If you're not convinced about that yet, then I'd encourage you to show up next week because honestly, the news gets worse before it gets better. Don't lose hope though. Paul has a lot to say about all of us for bad, but also a lot for good. There's a pattern we have to identify and kind of, kind of use as a foundation as we walk through this whole letter. And it looks like this. Ignorance breeds idolatry, which breeds immorality or depravity or godlessness and wickedness. Now, there's a couple of ways to look at ignorance. I have pleaded ignorance before that I just didn't know the speed limit was 45. I thought it was 55, right? And there is some true ignorance in that. But there's also ignorance when we did know, we just chose not to acknowledge or we dismiss what we know. That's the type of ignorance that Paul is talking about in this moment. What was true about God was very plain. You just ignored it. You just dismissed it. You rejected it. And Paul says what happens is when you live in ignorance, when you choose not to believe the truth about God, that leads to idolatry. You will quickly substitute something else in God's place. And many times those are things that aren't bad, like work or relationships, even our possessions. But when we worship those created things, instead of the creator, what's next is all kind of wickedness and depravity. It's a very slippery slope. So Paul says, don't be ignorant. Like, pursue the truth about God. That leads to life and godliness. In the next two verses, Paul gives an example of what this slippery slope looks like by referencing homosexuality. Now, just a few weeks ago, we took a dive into what the Bible has to say about God's design and intent for sexuality. And he is not silent about The fact that God has created sexuality to be something that is enjoyed and experienced between a man and a woman within the union of marriage. Paul does not give homosexuality as the only example of what it looks like when we ignore God, when we idolize things like pleasure or even sexuality or freedom that leads to all kinds of sin and depravity. He is simply pointing to homosexuality as an example of this happening, and he warns against it. He then continues to um, provide many other opportunities, many other examples of the like. Let's continue reading in Romans chapter 1. Paul says, furthermore, 
Just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. Remember, the they is who you see in the mirror. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. All the parents said, preach it, brother, right? Okay. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. That's a pretty all-inclusive list, wouldn't you say? It's a very fair description of all of us. It's quite an indictment. And the verdict is guilty as charged. That is the state of humanity. That is the bad news. All of us have lived in that way at some point or other. Some of us have experienced the good news that we'll talk about in the next couple of weeks. Some of you are still wallowing in what Paul describes in those verses. Feels a little unfair to leave us in this moment, but I chose to. I thought it might be a good motivator for you to show up next week and maybe hear some of the good news, right? But I also don't want you to wait till next week before you dig in to understand what Paul is trying to say to the Romans and to us about the gospel. He starts in chapter one and it's all through. Every week we're going to come back to looking at what is Paul saying about the gospel? Because if we miss that, we really have missed everything. And so I want to encourage you to engage in this letter with us. I'm asking you to. And to do that, we want to provide you some resources. We have a couple that I'll share with you this morning. First of all, is we're making available a journal that looks like this. And uh, it has plenty of space. It has the whole book of Romans in it. Lots of places to take notes and some good devotionals and some study helps. They're available for a donation of $5 in the atrium today while they last today. So pick up a journal if you would like one. Also, we've chosen a reading plan from the YouVersion Bible app for the book of Romans that we would encourage you to sign up for and journey with us as we study through this letter to the Romans. You can download it there with that QR code. That QR code's also on your bulletin. Or if you go to cccgo.com forward slash info, all the sermon resources are there. Let me just give you this uh, admonition. The reading plan has 30 days. We do not want you to start today and go for the next 30 days consecutively. What we are asking you to do is follow along with us, and we're going to work through the whole reading plan together. And so for this coming week, there are two days, day one and day two. They focus on Romans chapter one that we've started to look at today. I'd encourage you to use this reading plan. It provides you a four-step process for reading scripture. You could read any scripture this way, but we're learning it through the book of Romans. So sign up for that reading plan. If you've never downloaded the YouVersion Bible app, I would encourage you to do that today. And then finally, for those of you who might want to take a little deeper dive into the book of Romans, we've identified a seminary-level course on the book of Romans. It's provided by Ozark Christian College. Uh, One of the professors there, Michael DeFazio, several men from Crossroads actually went through this study earlier this spring I was one of those, and I would highly recommend it to you. It looks like two things, but it's actually just one. It's this Roman study. I think there's 12 um, videos that you can watch. They last about 15 to 20 minutes. There's actually a study guide that goes along with it. It would be ideal for you to use for your personal Bible study, for a couple or a family, maybe if you have kids, middle school, high school, and older, or for your small group. We want to provide that as a resource for you. All of these would be helpful for you to grasp what Paul is trying to communicate to the Romans and certainly to us. Just two days ago, uh, Christy and I dropped our youngest child off at college. The last birdie is out of the nest. I should say probably not forever because uh, as many of you know, we have a child with an intellectual disability. So we're going to be those parents, like 70-year-old parents with their 35-year-old child at Disney, if you know what I mean, okay? I'm not saying that out of bitterness. I'm just saying that's kind of how we're going to roll. So emptiness plus one is what we're calling it. But Kendall is off to her uh, next season of life. And uh, what that means is tomorrow, I have made a commitment to write Kendall a handwritten letter 
every week for her whole first semester. And if I follow suit like I did with her older sister, probably most of those will have like a $10 gift certificate to somewhere. And that's just a way for me to remind her that we love her, that she is missed a little, and that uh, we really want the best for her, right? I couldn't tell you if her older sister has a, one of those single notes that I wrote her. And I don't expect Kendall to put them in this nice little box and have them and you know, give them back to me on her wedding day. I, there's no expectation like that. But I do hope that she knows why I would write that letter to her. It's because I love her. I want what's best for her. I want to encourage her. And if correction is needed, I'll provide that too. You know, sometimes understanding why those things are written helps you kind of appreciate why they're written and, and hang on to the importance of them. hope today maybe I've just whetted your appetite a little bit for why Paul wrote to the Romans. And I hope that you'll lean in you engage in what we're trying to learn from what Paul had to say. It was inspired by God, not just to that one group of people, but to all of us. And it really helps us understand what the gospel is all about. The gospel is truly these things. It's first, understanding who God is. It's recognizing that God is holy and just. He is powerful. He is trustworthy. He is compassionate. He is merciful. If we miss that, man, we, we really should have just stayed home and watched the UK game at noon, right? If we miss that, we really missed the whole thing. But it's bigger than that, my friends. It's understanding that God wants a relationship with us. He created us to have a relationship with us. And you know what happened. The reason that that passage describes us so much is that we have easily exchanged him for lots of other things. And all of that has led us right down a path to so far away from him, some of us don't even know where to turn back. The gospel says that God reached out to us. He pursued a relationship with us. He invited us into his family, not because we deserved it, but because he loved us. He made a way for us to be part of his family through the death and resurrection of Jesus. But it doesn't end there either. He invited us in. He obligated us to the family business. He says, if you're part of my family, then I want you to be part of what I'm doing in the world around us. And that is taking this message, this good news, and telling it to everyone. And that is not optional. It's not like, I'll take the first three. I'm not sure if I want to upgrade on the fourth one. I'll just take three out of four. That's not bad. No, it's all or nothing. I hope today you begin to understand just what the gospel is. And you'll not just understand it, but you'll experience it. And you'll share it with everybody around you. You know, I don't know what kind of voices you hear when you look in the mirror. I don't know what letter you might even be writing to yourself. It might contain words that somebody once said to you. I pray that the words of Romans would be what you start hearing when you look at yourself in the mirror. And there'll be some hard things that you'll need to hear. Also, I hope that you'll hear most of all just how much God loves you, that he had made a way for you to be part of his family. He's gifted you and commissioned you to be part of what he's doing in the world around us. I want to pray to that end right now. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for who you are. And thank you for revealing yourself to us. God, when I feel the wind on my face, when I see the moon in the sky, when I think about how plants grow and how babies are born, God, when I think of all that, I recognize that there is someone who is powerful and wise and creative behind it all. And I know who that person is. It's you. You have revealed yourself so plainly. And I just want to confess that so many times, despite that, I've shoved so many else, so many other things in the god shaped hole that's in my heart. God, most of those things are good things, but they all pale in comparison to you. You stand alone as the only thing that can bring true purpose and life and meaning and value and true love. So God, thank you for not just dismissing that, actually doing something about it. Thanks for placing all the mess I've made of the life you've blessed me with on the shoulders of Jesus who died in my place. God, thank you 
for entrusting me with the gospel. Thank you for giving me, and not just me, but every person who is hearing my voice today. You've offered us the opportunity to be part of your family and to join you in what you're doing in the world around us. And God, there really is no other option. There really is no second choice. There really is no opt out. So God, I pray as we study the precious words that you inspired Paul to write to the Romans and to us, God, the, the, the truth of the gospel would just sink deep into us and it would begin to express itself out in many different ways. All for your glory, God, and also so that those who don't know the good news would also see it and hear it alive in us. I pray to that end through the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.